Hello my beautiful friends, welcome back to my channel, or if you are new here, my name is Cami, and what I like to do here on YouTube is I like to cover cases that either no YouTubers have covered or not many other YouTubers have covered, and that's exactly what we're doing today. I've heard about this case since I was young, but the school that I went to kind of just said, here's who this person is, here's what happened to him, that's it. I live in the American South, and the American South is not exactly known for its high standards of education. I think we're like the 45th state in education. I live in Louisiana, so, but this, even so, I know every single person has heard of this, even if we don't know the details of this case, which I didn't until I actually looked into it. So I am going to stop blabbering and I'm going to get right into the case. On August 28th, 1955, in Money, Mississippi, a 14 year old boy's badly disfigured body was pulled from the Tallahatchie River. This child's body was so badly disfigured that it took his uncle identifying an initialed ring on him to identify him. This child was Emmett Till. How did he get in the Tallahatchie River? And who was he as a person? That is what we are going to be going over today. Emmett Till, whose nickname was Bobo, was born on July 25, 1941, on the south side of Chicago, to Mammy Carthen and Louie Till. Louie and Mammy separated in 1942 when she discovered that Louie was having an affair, but she also cited Louie's abuse. He had choked her to the point of unconsciousness, and in turn, she threw scalding water on him to get him off of her. She got a restraining order against him, which he violated in 1943, and the judge ordered that he basically had to choose between jail and enlisting in the army, which I don't know why you'd want someone like that in the army, but those were his choices. In 1945, just a few weeks before his son's uh, fourth birthday, Louis was actually executed for the rape of an Italian woman. Now let's talk about Mammy for a second because it's very important to establish what kind of area that Money, Mississippi was. Mammy was born in a town called Webb, Mississippi, which is a very small town. It's got like less than a thousand people in it. And when Mammy was two, she moved her family to Argo, Illinois, and they moved during what's known as the Great Migration, which is where black families would move from the South to the North to escape the violence against black people that was still going on in the South. Now, Argo actually had so many black people migrate there that it became known as Little Mississippi. And Mammy's mother's home became known as a layover home, which if you don't know what a layover home, it's pretty much where, um, like where black people would stay while they were looking for jobs and for housing. Now, Webb was actually part of the Mississippi Delta. And in this time period, Mississippi was known as one of the poorest states, which still isn't that far off from now. It's, I think it's still one of the poorest states. And the counties that were part of the Delta counties were some of the poorest in Mississippi. The county that Mammy was born in only had an average household income of about uh, like $7,000 for black people and job opportunities were basically non-existent. Most men became sharecroppers for white people and that's also where they lived was on this land that the white people owned. Additionally, black people were still being excluded from voting since 1890 when voting laws were passed to bar black people from voting. And Jim Crow laws also kept black people incredibly disenfranchised. So black people weren't able to vote against these laws and it basically kept white people in power while keeping black people oppressed. And in a lot of places, this is still the case. It's just got different wording. Nowadays, we just keep black people from voting by putting them in prison for weed, slapping a felony label on them, and passing laws that say that felons can't vote. Today, while it's technically no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination, exclusion, etc., it's still perfectly legal to discriminate against convicted criminals in nearly all ways, which it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. Once labeled a felon, even for a minor drug crime, the old forms of discrimination are suddenly legal again. And Michelle Alexander, who is a civil rights attorney turned legal scholar, says this as well. Literacy tests were put in place to keep black people from voting and to keep them from serving on juries, which I don't know if you've ever looked at one of these literacy tests, but I have, and I don't even think I could pass one of these literacy tests. So in areas where black people got an objectively worse education than white people due to the lack of funds provided and just for keeping discrimination alive and well, there's no way they'd be able to pass these tests. Michelle Alexander says, people are swept into the criminal justice system 
particularly in poor communities of color, at very early ages, typically for fairly minor nonviolent crimes. The young black males are shuttled into prisons, branded as criminals and felons, and then when they're released, they're relegated to a permanent second-class status, stripped of the very rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement, such as the right to vote, the right to serve on juries, the right to be free of legal discrimination and employment, and access to education and public benefits. Many of the old forms of discrimination that we supposedly left behind during the Jim Crow era are suddenly legal again once you've been branded a felon. Additionally, this was made worse by Reagan's war on drugs, which led to mass incarceration of black males, and how difficult it was once labeled as a felon. Even now, in 2021, it's nearly impossible for convicted felons to get well-paying jobs and hold careers. Michelle Alexander says in her interview, he declared the drug war primarily for reasons of politics, racial politics. Numerous historians and political scientists have documented that the war on drugs was part of a grand Republican Party strategy known as the Southern Strategy of using racially coded get tough appeals on issues of crime and welfare to appeal to the poor and working class whites, particularly in the South, who were resentful of, anxious about, and threatened by many of the gains of African Americans in the Civil Rights Movement. Michelle Alexander then goes on to say, Today there are more African Americans under correctional control, in prison or jail, on probation or parole, that were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. There are millions of African Americans now cycling in and out of prisons and jails or under correctional control. In major American cities today, more than half of working age African American men are either under correctional control or branded felons and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. Federal funding has flowed to state and local law enforcement agencies who boost the sheer numbers of drug arrests. State and local law enforcement agencies have been rewarded in cash for the sheer numbers of people swept into the system for drug offenses thus giving law enforcement agencies an incentive to go out and look for the so-called low-hanging fruit, stopping, frisking, searching as many people as possible, pulling over as many cars as possible in order to boost their numbers up and ensure the funding stream will continue or increase. So at some point after this, Mammy and Emmett then moved to Detroit and in 1951, she married a man named Pink Bradley. Emmett actually preferred living in Chicago, so he returned there to live with his grandmother, and later that year, his mom and his stepmom rejoined him. So in 1952, the marriage between Mammy and Pink Bradley ended up dissolving, and after this, Pink ended up moving back to Detroit alone, and following their separations, Pink kind of began to stalk Mammy, and he started to threaten her, and eventually Emmett got a knife and basically said, hey, if you come back here and bother my mom, I'm gonna kill you. So the neighborhood that Emmett lived in was a working class neighborhood, and Mammy began working for the US Air Force as a civilian clerk because it paid a better salary than the job that she had. And while she was working, Emmett would take care of the house, and sometimes he would forget to do his chores, just like any kid. And I know, <laughs> I know my mom would tell me like a hundred times to clean something up, but I just, <laughs> I didn't. So even back then, kids were kids. <laughs> Emmett actually attended a segregated elementary school, but given that it was Chicago, the segregation wasn't anything like what the South was dealing with as far as segregation. According to Emmett's friends, he was a very happy boy and he was kind of known <laughs> as a prankster. He really loved to, p to play pranks and for the most part, his mom kind of let him because they were harmless and, you know, he's a 14 year old boy and my brother will tell me all the time, I have a 14 year old brother, he'll tell me all the time that he pranked someone. So that's just how kids are, especially little boys. Emmett loved going to baseball games, especially with his friends. It was one of his favorite pastimes. And Emmett dressed very clean cut. You never saw him in anything dirty. His clothes were always nice and pressed. This kind of made him stand out among his friends because all of his friends just didn't really dress that way. But by the time that Emmett was 14, by 1955, he was a big boy. He was five foot four, he had a stocky build, and he weighed around 150 pounds. And I bring up his build because it's important to remember for later when we get into the details of the case. However, when he went to go spend the summer in Mississippi, his mom warned him that 
It's not going to be like Chicago. He really needed to watch it with the pranks because in Mississippi, they won't react the same as in Chicago. In Chicago, they were kind of starting to move away from segregation because the year before 1955, they were moving away from segregation because of the Brown versus the Board of Education. It had been won the year before, but Mississippi was still very deep in Jim Crow laws. And in fact, it wasn't until 2013 that Mississippi even ratified the 13th Amendment. So up until 2013, slavery was still technically legal in Mississippi. And the reason that it was still legal in Mississippi up until this time is because of an oversight as far as submitting the necessary documentation to abolish slavery. They ratified the 13th Amendment in 1995, but they never actually notified the U.S. archivist, so it was never actually official until 2013, which is when they fixed it. That's wild to me. I don't know why that's so crazy to me, considering Mississippi is, like, known for being so racist, but... It's crazy to me that they didn't actually abolish slavery until 2013. How did no one notice that loophole? Like, I understand that there's like a stereotype that the South is like not super intelligent and we're like one of the worst in education. I think Mississippi is the worst in education, but it just kind of is crazy to me that no one saw that loophole. No one saw that oversight until almost 20 years after slavery was abolished. 1995 is when the 13th Amendment was ratified in Mississippi. But it wasn't, ofi- it wasn't official until 2013. <laughs> That's just crazy to me. Anyway, so during the summer of 1955, his great uncle Mose actually came to visit and his great uncle Mose was a sharecropper and a part-time minister in Money, Mississippi. And his great uncle Mose had stories to tell. He said, this is everything that goes on and this is everything and It got Emmett really curious. He's like, wow, I want to go to all these places. And he really wanted to see what all the fuss was about in Money, Mississippi. He was curious. And his mom, he wanted to go visit his great uncle Moe's. So his mom and him actually had a vacation plan to Nebraska to go visit some of their relatives. But Emmett begged his mom to let him go stay the summer with his great uncle Moe's in Money, Mississippi. And she was kind of reluctant because she knew how Mississippi was. She knew they were still very deep in Jim Crow laws. But eventually she did give in and she did tell Emmett that he could go spend the summer with his great uncle Moe's. So Emmett was planning to go to Mississippi with two other relatives named Wheeler Parker. And then their other cousin, Curtis Jones, was going to join them after. And Money was a super small town. At the time, they only had three stores, a school a cotton gin, and it was about eight miles north of Greenwood, Mississippi. So I've kind of already gone into how segregated the South was, but I'm not going to go too much into it because if I did, I would be here for hours. But something I do want to point out is that by the 1950s, even though it was still heavily segregated, lynchings weren't as common as they were between 1876 and 1930. Emmett arrived in money on August 21st, 1955. And when he got there, his great uncle was like, okay, look, you could stay here, but you got to help me around the farm. And Emmett was happy to do that. You know, he helped clean the house while his mom was at work. So he's like, okay, that's fine. On August 24th, he and his cousins had skipped church that morning and went to a local store called Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market where they were going to buy candy. And the boys they were with were also children of sharecroppers and they had been pi- they had been picking cotton all day. So of course they wanted a break. They're like, let's go to the store. Let's go get some candy. We deserve it after a long day of work. This store was owned by a young couple named Roy and Carolyn Bryant. So while they're all standing outside, just kind of goofing around, you know, as kids tend to do, Carolyn's sister-in-law was in the back like, She had her eyes on the kids. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that the Bryants were white. So Curtis went to go play checkers across the street and left Emmett with the other kids. And allegedly, because, you know, Emmett was a prankster, um, Emmett at one point had pulled out a picture of this white girl and he's like, this is my girlfriend back at home. And all the other kids were like, what? You got a white girlfriend? No way. If you really do, go talk to the lady at the register. So he did. So allegedly, this is what happened. Allegedly, Emmett goes into the store, buys some candy, and tells Carolyn, who was working at the front counter, bye baby, and walks out. Now keep in mind, there are no witnesses to this. So Carolyn's 
gonna kind of take advantage of the fact that there were no witnesses. I hate this woman. So when her husband, Rob, gets back from his business trip a few days later, Carolyn tells him that Emmett had come into the store, started grabbing at her, started making advances on her, and Wolf whistled at her while making lewd comments about her. And this pisses Rob off. So he goes to Emmett's great uncle's house to go have a word with Emmett. And he's with his half brother, J.W. Milam. So this is super early in the morning. Like, I don't even think that the sun was out yet. This is August 28th. And he pulls out this gun when Mose answers the door and tells him that he's here for Emmett. So they kidnap this 14 year old child and force him into the car. And allegedly they start driving around and like I said, allegedly beat Emmett in a shed behind JW's home, then went to the ha Tallahatchie River where they forced him to carry the 75 pound cotton gin fan to the bank of the river. They ordered Emmett to strip before beating him, gouging his eye out, shooting him in the head, tying his body to a cotton gem with barbed wire, and then threw him in the river. The gunshot killed him, but honestly, with how badly he was disfigured, I think he would have died from being beaten to death anyway. So his great uncle Mose reported Emmett kidnapped, but it still took police three days to find Emmett's body. And initially, the sheriff denied that it was Emmett, saying that there's no way this could be a 14-year-old boy because of his build, that this was an adult that they had found. I'm pretty sure up until his dying day, the sheriff said that he thought Emmett was still alive. I don't know if it took the cops so long to find his body because they just didn't care, seeing as it was Jim Crow, Mississippi, or if they just genuinely couldn't find him. But if you want my opinion, I think it's because they just didn't care. That's just my opinion. So authorities wanted a quick burial. They wanted to just throw him in this grave. But Mammy, once she found out what they wanted, she said, absolutely not. Send my child's body here so that way I can have a funeral for him. One day after the body was found, the NAACP did a press release about the murder. And if I can find that, I'll put it in the description below. Mammy insisted on an open casket funeral because in her words, she wanted everyone to see what a few racists had done to him. And a photographer at Jet Magazine named David Johnson took photos of the body of Emmett Till and published them, which, okay, I know what we're all thinking. We're all thinking, you know, paparazzi are vultures, man. And normally I would agree, but this time it actually led to major news sites picking up the story and it led to laws being passed which i'll get into those a little bit later in the video so i'm not going to put photos of the body here i will never put photos of dead bodies in my videos because one i don't think it's necessary two i think it's disrespectful to show what these people looked like in their last moments of life for monetization and three youtube would get on me like that but i have seen this photo and I don't recommend looking it up because I was completely caught off guard whenever I saw the photo. And let me tell you, I've seen a lot of dead bodies when looking up information of cases. And I've seen a lot of gruesome crime scenes, but I've heard a lot of recordings that are nauseating. But this particular photo is the only one to have actually made me cry. And it's, it's a hard one to look at. It's, I think it's an important photo because like I said, it led to a lot of laws being passed, but I don't, I don't recommend looking it up, but you can find it on Google if you search for it, but I don't recommend it. Over 50,000 people attended Emmett's funeral because it spread like wildfire what had happened and people really just wanted to pay their respects. Less than two weeks later, the trial began in a segregated courthouse with a few witnesses except for Mose, who identified Rob and JW as the murderers. The other two witnesses were Wheeler Parker and Simon Wright. The jury was all white, all male, because at the time, black people and women were not allowed to serve on a jury. And on September 23rd, the all white jury took less than an hour before they declared these two murderers not guilty. They claimed the state had not proven its identification of the body and the entire country was outraged by them not indicting them on the charges of kidnapping. So since double jeopardy is a thing, which if you don't know what double jeopardy is, it basically means that you can't be charged twice for the same crime. 
So since they couldn't be charged again after being found not guilty, this magazine basically paid them to talk about the murder. They were interviewed by their lawyer and a journalist in 1956 for Look Magazine. I haven't heard of Look Magazine, but that's, that's who interviewed them. And they were paid $4,000 to talk about what they had done to this child. The article was called The Shocking Story of Approved Killing in Mississippi. Now, I couldn't find this full article, but I did find an excerpt from it where JW talks about killing Emmett Till and basically bragging about it. And there was a lot of N-words in it, and it was, it was horrible. Side note, why do we pay people to talk about the crimes they've committed? Granted, I know that if you're found guilty because of Son of Sam laws, you can't be paid for it, you can't make money off of your crime, but people that are very obviously guilty, like these guys, why pay them? It doesn't make any sense to me. This child is dead, and these assholes are richer and didn't have any jail time for it. It, it pisses me off so much, I hate these guys. So in 2017, it was stated in a book by Tim Tyson called The Blood of Emmett Till that Carolyn recanted her statement and said, nothing that boy could have ever did could justify what happened to him. Which, okay, lady, you know what Jim Crow era Mississippi was like, and you knew what your words as a white woman would carry. So you knew what your husband would do. Why didn't you think of that before you lied? So I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I'm not gonna hide my dislike for this woman because if this woman hadn't lied, this child would not have been brutally murdered as he was. I hope she had a terrible rest of her life. I, sh I think she might still be alive. I hope she has a terrible rest of her life and gets no sleep over what she did. Both Rob and JW died of cancer. And I have a lot of thoughts about that as someone who has had cancer, but you know what? I'm just gonna say it. Maybe this makes me horrible, but I hope it was painful. In 2004, the Department of Justice actually reopened the case after it was revealed that people may still be alive that participated in the murder, specifically because JW's brother Leslie said that he had helped with the murder. So Emmett's body was exhumed by the FBI and in 2005, an autopsy was performed, but in 2007, a grand jury decided not to seek additional indictments against anyone, which maybe, Maybe I'm weird, but if someone came to me and they were like, yeah, I helped with this murder, why would you not, why would you not seek additional indictments? Like, this case makes me so angry, and it, even to this day, this poor child has not gotten any justice, and this case is so heartbreaking. It, it makes me sad, it makes me angry, it makes me... <sighs> Emmett's body was buried in a new casket and the original one was placed in storage at Burr Oak Cemetery in Alsip, Illinois. I don't know if I'm saying that right. In 2009, there was a scandal that involved reselling grave plots, which led police to investigate this cemetery and they ended up finding Emmett's original casket <laughs> rusting away abandoned in a workshed on the outskirts of cemetery property. So I guess that's what they meant by storage. And this, like I said, this makes me so mad. This poor child's original casket was not even respected enough to put it somewhere safe. And I'm laughing because it's insane to me. The original casket, the one that they had left to rust, was actually donated to the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And the place where they found Emmett's body was turned into a memorial. So it's got this sign with dedicated to Emmett Till. But it keeps getting vandalized, so that should tell you all you need to know about this place even now. And the new one that they put up as of, I think, like 2018 or 2019, is in the most recent years, is bulletproof, made of steel, and weighs 500 pounds. So they really took into account that people were vandalizing it by stealing it, um, set it on fire, and shotting, shooting at it. So the people that live here are just genuine gems, I guess. The place that his funeral was held was called Robert's Temple Church of God in Christ, and it's considered one of America's most endangered historic places as of 2020 because it's like completely falling apart. There's a bunch of structural issues with it. So Rosa Parks has actually said that whenever she refused to move from her seat on the bus, that she was inspired by Emmett Till, that she thought of Emmett Till. 
So I guess his murder is what inspired her not to move from her seat and is what kicked off the bus boycotts. All right, so let's talk about the bills that were passed as a result of the photograph of Emmett's body and from the lynching. There's a ton and I will leave in the description resources where you can further look into the bills that were passed because first of all, there's a lot of them and a lot of them involve legal terms that I don't completely understand. So we're just gonna go into like the two major ones that were passed. The Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, which legally classified lynching as a hate crime and the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Act, which established an unsolved crime section in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. And that, my friends, is the story of the unnecessary murder of Emmett Till. And there's um, there's quite a bit surrounding his lynching that I didn't cover just because of time restraints. And some of it kind of confused me as well. So like I said, I will leave every single source, every single resource that I used down in the description below. So that way you can read more about this just that I didn't get a chance to cover. I'll be honest, I don't really know how to end this one. It's such a tragedy. It did not need to happen. And I, I wanna know what you guys think of this one, even though I think this is such an important case. And if you're like me and didn't know much about this case, I think it's important to get the story out there for those who don't know. So I will see you all in my next one. Bye.